Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of the Agency Way of Room 214 Weekly Blab series to help marketers learn from subject matter experts within a marketing agency, uh, in addition to guest thought leaders in business and marketing worldwide. I'm Jason Cormier. I'm your host, as well as the co-founder of Room 214, which is a digital and social marketing agency. Uh, our guest on the show today is Maya Schaff. Uh, my, Maya is a senior account director at Room 214. Uh, she's led social media strategy, uh, content creation, and campaign development for companies like Sports Authority, uh, Forever 21, Horizon Organic, the list goes on. Uh, Maya is an individual who, I'll just say, she really geeks out on analytics uh, and engagement hacking, sorry for that buzzword, uh, <laughs> on a wide range of social networks. Um, I know Maya is constantly applying the kind of behavioral insights uh, people like Michael Qualick dig up uh, to help companies leverage social media, uh, mostly I'd say to drive awareness, uh, interest, um, but also sales. Uh, and so um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that today. Welcome to the show, Maya. Thanks, happy to be here. All right, awesome. Well, cool, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, for those of you who haven't been on the Blab before, we do target 20 minutes. We know your time's valuable. Uh, we like to, to get through it quickly. So Maya, my first question is, um, since today's topic is really uh, building, you know, around the idea of social media programs that use multiple channels, I think I wanted to first clarify the idea of campaigns, social media campaigns versus evergreen content. And so when it comes to building a comprehensive program uh, for social media, maybe you can just tell, tell our audience a little bit about your approach. Sure. So... Um, campaigns and evergreen content are both extremely important to a digital strategy. Uh, when we're thinking about kind of a year long social calendar, we would aim to have a social campaign, at least one per quarter. Um, and what we really try to do is build content stories for each month of the entire year that really ladder up to a brand's story. Um, and then build campaigns or evergreen content around that larger idea and then each of those smaller content phases. Um, campaigns in particular are a really great opportunity for brands to dive very deeply into that brand story that they wanna tell. Um, they are able to really identify what their customers want to hear um, throughout kind of the rest of the year and during an evergreen content campaign and then really pinpoint what not not only what consumers want to hear, but what the brand wants to tell and hopefully create some really great content and draw in new people and engage uh, based on what not only their business goals are, but just, you know, a brand having a conversation on social media, mm -hmm. which is in the end what it's for. Right. Um, and, yeah. And I think, you know, I think that's worth mentioning because I feel like companies, um, you know, they I, what I see anyway in our own experiences, we see them falling in this trap of, you know, being so campaign focused and okay, you know, we have to have a campaign and I get it. Um, you know, companies need to make money, sell products and services. Uh, but to your point, you know, there is an ongoing conversation that uh, can be taking place. And, you know, what we've seen is companies that are really more consistent about um, what those stories are and, and really being a part of that conversation seem to enjoy more success on social media than just, you know, very much campaign focused, you know, this quarter we're going to sell X, uh, the campaign's going to start here, it's going to end there. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm glad, I'm glad you're able to talk about that a bit. Definitely. And ideally, your evergreen content is helping you kind of ramp into these campaign phases and then ramp back out and you still have a strong story to hang your hat on during evergreen content phases, but they they really, all of those stories build on each other throughout the year. So it always feels really cohesive, but you're able to kind of say different things in different ways throughout all of those different stories. Mm -hmm. Cool, well, I know um, we recently saw a, a request for a proposal where the prospect was saying, um, you know, basically what they were asking for was content production uh, for posts on Facebook uh, and pretty, pretty large audience, um, somewhere around a million Facebook fans. Um, but they, they were noting that they would then want that same content posted over on Instagram. Uh, and, you know, of course, we always want to to uh, satisfy, you know, potential client requests. 
Um, but we also know <clears throat> that's not really a best practice. And so <laughs> what can you tell uh, our audience in terms of best practices and, and how they might pertain uh, with respect to copying content from, from one social channel to another? Yeah, so I mean, we totally understand the challenge of creating enough content. <laughs> it's a challenge that literally every single brand has, so you're not alone. Um, but when you look at just even the basic proprietary platform analytics, you'll see that across platforms, you're talking to different people. So it just doesn't really make sense to create, put all this effort into creating content and then push it out to people who actually care about different things. So likelihood is, and this isn't true across the board, but most likely your Facebook audience is a little bit more female driven, a little bit more family focused. They want longer stories that are more emotional and um, you know, they also are more willing to be sold to because there is that longer format uh, copy box on Facebook. And then when you think about Instagram, it's super visual. Yeah, you can post a long amount of copy on your post, but really when you think about, you know, as a user, what are you looking through? You're just looking at images. So those two platforms are, the, the consumer behavior is really different, but you also don't want to, you know, talk about a mommy blogger to maybe your more male focused or tech savvy audience that might be on Instagram. So we strongly recommend that you have dedicated strategies for each platform. Um, and like I said, of course, we understand that that's challenging. But if you were ever going to repurpose co content, maybe spread it out. So if you posted something on Facebook, wait a month to post it on Instagram so that everything feels really different. But again, that's really not what we would recommend mm -hmm. if we had our way. Sure. Yeah. And I, and I know we didn't discuss this earlier, but um, I, I hear the question a lot. So I feel like I, I'll just bring it up now. A lot of people are like, okay, well, how often, you know, should we post per day on Facebook mm -hmm. or on Instagram mm -hmm. or on Twitter, et cetera. Right. And, right. Um, you know, I mean, what do you say to that question? It just varies. Um, what we often recommend for clients who are really looking to ramp up their content posting um, is to just go ahead and test it. Some audiences don't hit content fatigue until you're posting three times a day. Um, and some only want a message from your brand once a day or even five times per week. But it's really hard to know where that fatigue is gonna happen until you see that drop off begin uh, when you're posting too much. I would say generally try to target once per day um, if you were just trying to have a starting off point and go up from there. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Um, so since, you know, as a account director who's very much focused on social media, since you're really knee deep in producing things like editorial content calendars and coming up with ideas for social content, um, I would just like to ask you to share an experience where maybe you thought a certain kind of content would work, um, but it really didn't. And then as a result, what did you learn? Okay. Well, although I don't want to talk about <laughs> times <laughs> that things didn't work. Yeah, no, actually, props right yeah. now, just to encourage <laughs> okay. you right here. There it is. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we produced these amazing illustrated videos um, with custom, like I said, custom illustrations, custom music, custom lyrics for Horizon Organic. Um, they were really cute and had a really strong message about eating organic food. Um, and we knew that they were perfect for the audience, which is really a lot of moms. Um, they just hit really perfectly. And so we produced all these videos. We put a lot of effort into it, working with the brand very closely and um, finally got our first video done and posted it on YouTube and put it on the brand's Facebook page. And nobody really saw it. It just did not get the views that we were anticipating seeing. So the first video was kind of part of a series so it was okay we had a few more videos to play with and what we did is really build out a very strong paid promotion plan um, we helped them build banner ads we promoted the videos across lots of different digital sites uh, we put paid spend behind our actual youtube page and channel as well as producing some b-roll for the vid videos so it was a really comprehensive paid promotional plan. And um, in the end, the videos ended up being the highest performing in the company's history. So although I know a lot of people 
don't love that social is pay to play. We just saw such a huge impact from putting some dollars behind this video that we wanted our whole audience and a much larger audience than the brand's existing audience to see. And in the end, they did see it, but uh, we did learn from from the first video. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So bottom line is bottom line. social media works well with advertising and advertising works well with social media, maybe, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, I think most people know this by now, but, um, you know, content shared on Facebook uh, actually gets distributed to only around 1% of a brand's total Facebook audience organically. Uh, and since we know that it is a it is a pay to play part of social media now, um, maybe you can just share some insights with us regarding how companies should go about paying to get more visibility in social. Yeah, definitely. Um, so kind of on that note of the videos that we were able to successfully promote, uh, although we had a very strategic plan in, in that case, I would say when it comes to pay to play, don't be afraid to experiment. If your strongest audience is on Pinterest, make viable pins, make it easy for fans to find and pin content from your website um, and promote pins. Uh, if, if Facebook is it, then you're golden because there are so many different advertising options on Facebook. You can definitely find one that perfectly fits your strategy, but try something else as well. Um, because the only way to really push yourself and find where you'll be most successful is maybe perhaps getting a little bit outside of your comfort zone and, and trying something new, you be really surprised and, and happy by seeing your results and, and you know, whatever those metrics of success might look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So test, test often. Test. Yeah. Um, is there, uh, is there, is there any single trend or thing of the future that you have your eye on when it comes to how businesses are using social media today? Yeah. Sorry. I know there's a little delay. I'm getting a little bit of feedback here, but um, yeah, trends. So everyone's talking about Snapchat and how brands are going to continue their foray into that network. And this week, everyone's talking about Peach. Um, but what I'm really focused on for the future is micro moments. So reaching consumers where they are in the moment of purchase um, and being able to be really creative with that. So is it the development of a mobile app and finding consumers in store, maybe not even your store, but can you find them in that moment, engage with them and perhaps, you know, encourage them to make a purchase at your location if, if that's what they need. I mean, you look at Google trends and people are, are actually not as loyal to brands as they used to be because they'll get on their phones and see, Oh, I meant to pick up, you know, a soccer ball and this sporting goods store is the closest to me. So I'm just going to go there because that's a good price and distance wise, it's near near to where I am. So um, how can you as a brand capture that moment and encourage people to come to where you are instead? And, and I don't think it has to be all about retail at all, uh, but I've really challenged myself in this next year to to be extremely creative with with what that moment is and how to just create a conversation around it, you know, not even really getting to that level of sales until the second tier of strategy. Micro moment marketing. Sweet. DM. Nice. All right. Well, um, I know we're, we're starting to run a little uh, short on time, but I also know that people love the practical and the tactical. And so maybe you can just tell us about um, tools that you use, maybe tips, tricks for marketers, either when it comes um, to selling stuff on social or tracking content or honestly, whatever else you can think of. Yeah, so I mentioned this earlier and if you're just kind of starting out, it can be so overwhelming, um, all the tools and tricks and formulas out there. Uh, I think a good place to start is just the platform's proprietary analytics. Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest all have pretty decent analytics. You can at least look at uh, who you're talking to and when they're online most, and generally your top performing content, so what they engage with most often. And those are all really good places to start. Uh, you definitely want to be optimizing your content around what I just said, who you're talking to, when they're online, and, the, and what they respond to most. Um, 
and trying to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. So I talked about testing on advertising, test yourself on social as well. Um, have you ever made a video as a brand? Maybe try, I don't know, still photography, still photography. You know, we see that performing obviously really well, especially on really visual platforms like Instagram. So how can you push yourself, try something new this year? And I think a lot of brands are able to find success when when they move outside of where they thought they should be. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. Cool. Very cool. Well, um, Maya, kind of switching topics now, but I always like to get into the, the human interest side as well. Would love to know what is the best book you've read this year uh, and why? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> the best book I've read this year is Good Night Moon. <laughs> Just kidding, uh, but I have a six month old at home. So most of the reading I've been doing is in the form of board books this year. Um, but on a more serious note, um, the book that I have most, least, most recently read, but really truly am just always coming back to is Winning the Story Wars by Jonah Sachs. Um, he, he dives into the heart of storytelling, which is really what we push to do at Room 214. What is the story and how is it relatable that your brand wants to tell and um, breaks down stories into basically like the five core stories that uh, that all stories filter into um, and how your organization's core values can create that story and then how you can tell it in a moral way and a meaningful way as a marketer. So that really resonates with me. It's really important to me to do good work that matters to people and helps people. Um, and so I love that book. I would recommend it to any marketer, any business person. I, I think it would benefit literally anybody who read it who's in this sphere, even tangentially. Cool. Yeah, Story Wars. I know we referenced that in, in uh, the storytelling workshop. Um, yeah. So uh, it's a great one. Well, awesome. Maya, thank you so awesome. much for joining Maya, us today. Joining really us. appreciate it. Really appreciate um, it. I know it's a good segue in terms of a book uh, for for this week. Um, recommendation of the book is uh, this baby right here, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. This is awesome, by the way. Um, it's not just about products. It's really about behavior uh, and what triggers habits. Uh, so highly recommended. Near Eyal, I probably just butchered that author's name, but an outstanding <laughs> book. Uh, our nonprofit shout out of the week goes to EFA.org. That's E-F-A-A, -A, the Emergency Family Assistance Association. This is actually a local uh, Boulder nonprofit, but it's been around for over 100 years. Uh, essentially, EFA helps families. Um, it helps them from uh, essentially sliding over into homeless, homelessness. And so uh, we love that organization. Uh, definitely check out EFA.org if you get a chance. Quote of the week, uh, there's always a better way. That's Thomas Edison. Uh, so love that one. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. As a reminder, you can follow us on Twitter at room underscore 214. Uh, you can also subscribe to our newsletter by going to room214.com slash blog. Uh, our weekly series continues every Thursday at 1130 a.m. Mountain. On behalf of everyone at Room 214, thank you for joining us for another episode of The Agency Way. <laughs>